as an academic, you always, you know, say whatever you think. Yeah. As a diplomat, you have to think whatever you're going to say, <laughs> and that's hard. You know, it's a very hard. You know, because before you say something, you have to think about the implication of it. You know, so yes. as an academic, you just say whatever you think. Yeah. You know, so that's that. That's the difference that I learned a lot. Hi, how are you, Dr. Rizal Spa? Good, I'm very good. <laughs> Selamat uh, pagi dan apa kabar? Very nice, you know, I think, you know, being here. And I really love, you know, all the conference that I just attended. Yeah, and it is a great privilege uh, for me to talk to you, a uh, scholar and practitioner, and both Sumatran. So yes. I'm, 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 uh, I'm very proud of that fact as well. <laughs> and we will talk, obviously, about your career as a scholar, practitioner, and a former serving ambassador uh, to UK, and um, also very active in uh, foreign policy, making the decisions as well. But before that, I want to start with your journey in uh, as an academic. Can you give us some sort of background on why you, did you decide to do your PhD instead of going to the ministry? Well, first of all, you know, I think uh, it's because when I was in say, the second year in the university mm. for my first degree, I already liked writing yes. uh, op-ed on, on international affairs and, and so on. And, you know, I like, you know, really reading and yeah. also understanding the way the international politics works. Yes. So that, you know, basically become the prime, you know, uh, motivation for me to become an academic mm. rather than, you know, uh, being the practitioners yeah. or, or diplomats. So uh, by the end of my uh, first degree uh, years, I decided that you know I would like to be a researcher yes. rather than you know a, a diplomat, and that's I think what really defined you know my uh, career later on. Yeah, yeah. So it is your calling. I remember mm. I was also interning at Kemlu, I did uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs when I was in undergrad, and then. I've always dreamt to, to be a, a diplomat, a career diplomat. That's why I enrolled in IR in University of Indonesia. But then when I was in the ministry, I was like, actually, I'm not sure if career diplomat is my calling. I yeah. think I like academic better. Is, is that how you feel as well? You, you've always see being an academic as your calling? Uh, not really, but you know, when I finished my high school yes. from Sumatra in Aceh, I wanted to go into the ITB, Institute of Technology of yes. But of course, you know, I couldn't make it. And then I get you know, in into the Pajajaran University, mm. to the Faculty of Social and Political you know, Science. Mm. So at that time, I had no idea what IR was. That's so, so you know, only in the second year, I started to uh, 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 like it, you know, because, you know, mm. they talk about like great power slavery, they talk about, you know, peace, war, and, and all this uh, world politics, you know, and so on. Then I started to, you know, write on op-ed. Yes. And that's, you know, I think how, you know, uh, I developed this deep interest, you know, is being a researcher, you know, on uh, uh, international and regional affairs. But why did you choose London School of Economics? Was it because of Michael Lever or was it because of London? What was the incentive of going there? Uh, well, actually, uh, simply because, you know, the IR in the UK Mm. It's a bit different from you know the US. Yes. So because if you remember all this debate about the behavioral sciences, you know, and and the traditional IR, you know, I'm I was not really interested in, you know, the quantitative, you know, uh, methods. Yeah. I'm not really into the positivist 
uh, approach you know in international relations because i do think that you know that the international relation is not a science you know like mm. the natural sciences yeah, yeah so yeah. that's an i think art, exactly yeah. so that's actually uh, uh uh make me you know mm. think that you know i think it's better mm. to study ir in the uk yes. rather than in the us and then i was fortunate because i could work w- with professor michael leeper yes. who is basically the dean you know of the southeast, southeast asia, asia IR, you know, yeah. in, uh, ir you know so you know i was quite lucky in that you know in that sense that because you know he really helped me to understand you know international relations you know very comprehensive systematic way Yeah, 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 and obviously I've read Michael Lever as a student of Southeast Asia, and I always admire how he combine balance of power, mm-hmm. very conventional ba- balance of power understanding with this nuanced view of domestic politics. Yes. <laughs> because you can you can tell that he understands Southeast Asia very well. But yeah. in your memory, what was it like working with him as a supervisor, your supervisor? In fact, you know, I disappeared for like a couple of months. Mm-hmm. I got so bored. I didn't want to touch, you know, the uh, dissertation, but Professor Lever is really helpful, you know, in trying to encourage me, you know, in, mm. you know, to come back, you know, to uh, the uh, focus of my uh, research and then yeah. finish it. So that's, you know, I think uh, something that a teacher, you know, could have, you know. So he's more than just a, a, a mentor, more than just a professor, yeah. but you know, it's also a teacher, you know, in in yeah. that sense. Would you describe him as a pragmatist, or would you describe him as an ideal idealist? Like, what would be some of the wisdom that he passed? He's perfectionist. Yeah. He's perfectionist. Yeah. You can tell yeah, from exactly. his work, obviously. Yeah. And uh, he helped, you know, uh, students from Southeast Asia, including, you know, in the language, you know, that you know uh, we used to write the dissertation. Yes. Yeah, 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 That's yeah, why, yeah. you know, he he was also the editor for. Broadleach. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which where your my your, dissertation was published. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and and in a way, before he passed, probably your work was one of the last thing he worked on. Perhaps was it, was it? Uh, was it not because... my dissertation, but yeah, yeah but the, 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 book the, the book on the Islam and uh, yeah. policy. Yeah. yeah, he helped me to you know like uh, give comments and so on on my second book until chapter four, you know? mm. and I didn't know that he was doing that. You know, he's already in hospital at that time. Wow. So so he helped me all the way until he passed away, and Michael Leifer basically commented on every page mm. that I wrote, you know, for the recitation. It's incredible teacher. Yeah, yeah. But I want to focus, uh, shift the focus slightly to your book, which inspired my work because I'm also working on Indonesia China as mm-hmm. uh, part of my PhD topics, and obviously everyone keeps saying, "Well, Rizal already made." Amazing work! Why are you doing this? Why are you trying to compete with him? I was like, no, no, no! I'm not trying to compete with Bang Rizal. And um, the trust of your book, why it is so rich? Because you you show that domestic debate, uh, and and how how did you do it? How did you <laughs> interview all these elites? How did what was it like doing research as a PhD student in Indonesia during the New Order period? Well, I was helped by the fact that you know I'm already a researcher at CSI, yes. right? Mm-hmm. And then you know I can actually uh, count on the support, you know, and help yes. of all the senior researchers, mm-hmm. you know, at, at CSI. You know, they the one who introduced me to all these, you know, foreign policy elite, yeah. including Pak Mohtar, you know, Kusumat yeah. Maja, yes. late Benny Murdani, and Definitely. all these uh, 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 key actors yeah. within the uh, uh, Bakin and 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 also within the Kadin, you know, and, yes. and, and so on. So that's helped a lot, you know, because. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, uh, I mean, those seniors at the uh, CSIS really, you know, uh, provided you know the the opportunity for me, you know, to get to know all these uh, uh, key, you know, elite uh, uh, in, in Indonesia's foreign policy uh, community. Mm. But having said that, you know, I think uh, the challenge is still the same, yeah. you know, because everybody was busy, yeah. and then you know, so you have to be very careful. You cannot do a interview, extensive interview. Mm. If you only have like three to six months, you mm. know, uh, field research in yeah. periods, you have to have one year. Yeah. You know, and but you know, I think there are a number of tricks that you know, I think the, the the student you know need to to understand as well. <laughs> but do not tell your, you know, uh, uh, respondents yeah. that you are going to stay more than two months. <laughs> If you say that I'm going to stay, you know, for one year, yeah. they will keep postponing you know the appointment <laughs> with you, and then you know by the end of your stay, then you'll be you know. 
basically frantically trying to you know yeah, get all the get interviews. All the interview just audience. tell them that you know you're there only two weeks three weeks and they, usually they give you the you know the the the, the, the appointment yeah, yeah yeah the second challenge i think it's also the same well a lot of things that you know they will tell you yeah. i mean at that time also they they told me you know the, the the story behind you know the headline and so on yes but after you they gave the interview they say all this confidential yes <laughs> hence you have a problem <laughs> you can't use all the information yes. that they gave you you know so it but it gave you the context you know right. for uh, the issue that you know you uh, are uh, researching yes so the same challenge is basically i think also today And obviously, it is all about relationship, right? Because you maintain and build yes, a relationship yeah, yeah. with yeah. these people, and you yeah. wanna keep that uh, yes, <laughs> relationship exactly. even after. But when you interview these key elites, the generals, the uh, foreign policy, what was uh, what was the eureka moment? Uh, the, 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 is there such a thing as eureka moment where you're like, ah, this is it? Uh, not really, you know, because each actor. You know, came up with different interpretation mm. of the same about the same event, of the yes. same fact. Uh, that's I think is quite natural. You know, in the yes. social science, you know, yes. research. Uh, for example, different elites would come up with different explanation. Yeah. Why they decided in say 1985, you know, to mm. have a direct trade relationship yes. with China. They would tell you different, you know, understanding about why did Indonesia. Was Pak Harto decided to resume diplomatic ties, yeah. you know, and then but one one thing is very interesting, uh, which helped me a lot in basically extracting the information mm. from this, you know, uh, elite is that when you say that uh, you, you try to juxtapose, you know, somebody's opinion with somebody else, and yeah. then you tell, for example, Mr. A said, well, I just met Mr. B. Mr. B said he was the one. You know who played a very important role in X. Yeah. Then, Mr. B would be furious. No, 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 it's not true. I was the one. So that's, you know, I think it's very important in technique yeah. that you could also use, you know, in you know, your own, you know, uh, research. You know, so yeah. they will tell you, you know, more and more. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. and because of this very Leiferian influence in your book, you you highlight both structural factor and domestic. Obviously, the domestic. Is where your contributions probably really key, but at the end of the day, it's always both factors, com- these combined factors that shape behavior, right? But it leaves me sometimes unsatisfied. Okay, but which one is stronger? And do you have any inclinations on on this one with regards to the normalization, for example? What do you think? Did you, or uh, at least your impressions when you were writing it? Domestic factors was always stronger than the structural factors, or it simply cannot be resolved. No, I don't think it's you know it's possible to tell that these factors are more important than yeah. others, because you know in my case you know I try to look at the functions of diplomatic relationships. Yeah. You know? So and also the function of the absence of diplomatic relationship, and then how that you know change. So, mm. so the function uh, change. Uh, when it will serve the domestic political, you know, objective of the uh, regime. When you know it doesn't serve domestic uh, 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 political objective of the regime. Yes, that's basically what I'm focusing on. Mm. And then you know, in order to understand the changing perceptions about the utility mm. of the diplomatic function, then of course the external factors came to play as Definitely, well. Yeah. You know, so that's why the questions of legitimacy. You know, yeah. political legitimacy become the key organizing concept yes. that I use to explain the shift in the perception of China as a threat, and then to right. you know China as a partner in the Definitely. development. So it's basically you know yeah. the combination of all those you know, and then mm. how it shape the change changes in the perception of uh, Indonesia's elite, especially yeah. the key policy maker. President Suharto himself. Definitely, yeah, yeah, and this is what's also thinking of talking about threat perceptions because it continued after the 90s, right? Mm-hmm. They normalized, right, yeah. and that the threat perceptions continued at least up to 98, perhaps, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. continued to there, there, there's this underlying suspicions when when Indonesia look at China, and yet President Suharto at the time decided that mm-hmm. let's normalize relations. We are ready, yeah. and. How do we make sense this disjuncture between 
threat perceptions and behavior? Well, each case probably will be different. Yeah? Yeah. When it comes to the role of China in our foreign policy, is, you know, I, I tend to see it like this. Uh, before 1990, uh, the Indonesian government you know, saw that legitimacy of the new order came from the fact that they serve as the guardians of the Indonesia state yes. from the communist threat. Yes. Right? And these communist threats come from China yeah. and the PKI domestically. Yeah. They managed to you know, uh, uh, address the problem of this communist threat internally. Mm -hmm. Then you know, they have also to safeguard Indonesia from the external communist mm -hmm. threat, which is China. So they need to create this stability so that the new order could focus on development. But from 1990s on, that construct change. Yeah. Then you know the government begin to believe that the threat from China as mm. a state begin you know to decline. Yes. Then you know the focus on development is more important than maintaining stability mm. because stability is already you know uh, uh, maintained. Yes. So that means you know the government see economic opportunities by working with China yeah. in order to strengthen the domestic legitimacy. Yes. From 1967 to 1990, the legitimacy of the new order rested with the ability to provide stability. Yeah. So that's, they can do development. Definitely. But from 1990, it shifted into mm. like, they need to provide you know, development in order to guarantee stability. Yeah. So China suddenly changed, you know, within yeah. the, the, that construction of, of, of thinking. Yes. So yes. that's, you know, I think, you know, a, a law uh, President Suarto, you know, to make a decision that it is time to restore diplomatic relation. But mm. you're right, it's not immediately, you know, uh, mm. change the way people think about, about yes. China. So it takes, you know, I think a couple of years mm. before the relationship began to take off. Yes. That's, I mean, interestingly, started in 1998. Yes. When we became a democracy. Yeah. Then, you know, we confidence enough to deal with yeah. the uh, China. I think that, that, that shift in track to you are being an academic and then you return to CSIS after your PhD in what we call it track 1.5 perhaps, although CSIS is a little bit fluid. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something that I want to talk next. Was there a significant adjustment when you return from London and start working at CSIS again? What was it like? Uh, it's not really because, you know, uh, at CSIS, you know, we're not an academic per se, yeah. Because you know we were we are, we are trained you know to think in terms of like policy relevance. Yes. So whatever you write, whatever you you know research on, mm. you always ask that ultimate question. Yeah. How does this relate to policy? Yeah. You know, so is that you know kind of like writing or 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 or, or, or research you know has policy relevance or not? Mm. So we are trained in that way. Yes. So it's more like policy analysts rather than academic, like in the university. Yes. So that's, you know, I think being trained by Michael Liefer you know, <laughs> in, at the London School of Economics helped me a lot in actually, you know, enforcing that way of thinking. Mm. So, you know, for example, how does this decision to restore diplomatic tasks with China help policy, yeah. you know, in, in Indonesia? So that's also, I think, you know, the environment at size. So I do not have, you know, any uh, uh, difficulties mm. in adjusting to the uh, 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 think tank, you know, world. Yes. So that's why, you know, I enjoyed, you know, being uh, <laughs> active in the uh, second track and CISCAP yes. and all these yes, ASEAN, correct. ICS, you know, and, and so on. Mm. Uh, that also helped me later on when I was an ambassador. Yes. Because whenever we write a memo yeah, or yeah. a report, you know, back home to Jakarta, and then to my staff, I always ask the question, how does that particular report that you write relates to Indonesia's national interest mm. and Indonesia's policy. And uh, in the in your earlier year after your PhD, you explored that themes of independent, but in Indonesian post-colonial sense, yeah. right? For example, in your Asian survey article that I uh, admire greatly about the evolution of Indonesia foreign policy, the theme of sacrifice, perjuangan, diplomacy, and kemerdekaan, right, independence, still very strong. Do you think this theme of post-colonial uh, kemerdekaan or independence still has relevance today, or have we moved on from that theme? 
Uh, I think you, you well as the general uh, principles, you know, in our foreign policy, that will continue. Mm. You know, that Indonesia will continue to subscribe to the principle of free and active. You know, Correct. it's about yes. uh, bebas and, and and active, and that will you know become the foundation of our foreign policy. And then, in my view, in fact, now it's become even more relevant oh, wow. with the changing you know uh, geopolitical landscape. Mm. You now, where you know you have again this you know great powers rivalry and competition. Yeah. So within that context, I think it would be foolish for Indonesia you know, to tie itself up to any you right. know, great powers. Right. So being independent is the key you know, yes. for preserving and achieving our national interest. Definitely. So it's not you know, basically dictated by you know, which power that we should be aligned with, yeah. but, you know, we, but it's, we, we should be dictated by what interest that we need to mm. really, you know, achieve. So in my view, it's going to be relevant all the time. Yeah, <laughs> and that is not unique to Indonesia, right? Because this post-colonial mindset, to some extent, is very Southeast Asia, because mm. we always have that mantra of we do not want to choose between great powers. We want to generate benefits from both of them, if possible, and uh, stuff play them off of each other, perhaps even. No, no. I think you no. Know, we need to clarify that you know not want to choose. And you know, being neutral yeah. or being you know independent, this is different things. Mm. You know, because we do need to choose, mm. but our choices should be dependent on our key national interests. Yes. So, but you know, within that, you know, I think spectrum, sometimes you know, probably will be seen, you know, like closer to US. Yeah. Sometimes on other sectors, other issues will be seen closer at the time, closer yes. to Soviet Union. Mm. You know, so that's why the article that I wrote at the uh, uh, Asian survey shows that you know because different interests would you know lead to different ones you know yes. in our you know foreign policy, yeah. but you know the the, the 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 red line is really the free and you know active, uh, uh, active uh, principle. Mm. So that's you know I think uh, 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 to suggest that you know the national interest should be the defining you know foundation of yes. any choices that we are going to make. Yes, yes, you know, and now and also. In, in the years to Definitely. Come. And obviously, the concept of interest is a very fluid thing. And it often relates yep. back to identity. And in your subsequent work, you explore that theme of identity in various ways, in soft power, mm -hmm. democracy. Uh, you write about Islam, uh, the, the, the dilemma of dual identity article, for example, yep. right? And this nexus of identity and interest is often uh, not very linear and straightforward in a way and it evolved as like Indonesia evolved as a country and their identity and interest evolve as the countries. Uh, how do you see this nexus between identity and interest? Identity is part of the interest, yes. domestic political interest, mm. right? And also the projection of that identity is actually, you know, our national interest as mm. well at the uh, international arena because, you know, when you conduct foreign policy, reputation is very important. Yes. Right? That link to the uh, concept of identity. Uh, why I focus or pay attention to this particular you know, issue? Simply because the world landscape changed after September yeah. 11. Mm. Right? And then Indonesia mm. also democratized. Yes. Then within that context, if you remember in 2001, 2002, especially after the yeah. Bali bombing, yeah. there was a lot of this speculation that, you know, uh, uh, democracy in Indonesia mm. and also the fact that we are the Muslim majority you know, yeah. in our country are not good combination. Yeah. So a lot of, of foreign analysts you know, uh, 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 believe that the democratization and Islam are not assets but liability yeah. you know, for Indonesia and also for, for the region. So I try to, to, to prove that you know, in Indonesia, Islam and democracy can be an asset. Mm. So then that's actually also uh, provide a new basis, you know, for the conduct of Indonesia's foreign policy. Yes. Yes. And especially after we democratize. So we want to be seen as a, a democracy that happened to have a Muslim population majority. Mm. And so mm. that is the uh, identity <laughs> that the government projected at the time, especially under uh, pa Hasan Wirayuda, yes. you know, as a foreign minister, and then went well beyond Pa Yudhoyono, you mm. know, until 2009. But by 2014, I do believe that we solved that problem. You know, mm. so Islam and democracy 
in Indonesia uh, was seen as an asset, mm. no longer as liability. Mm. So that's why you know we should move on and then try to focus on other identity that has been neglected mm. for such a long time, mm. which is Indonesia's identity as the maritime power, mm. you know, the maritime fulcrum, you know, that sit between two strategic oceans. Definitely. Definitely. That's when you know this ideas about the global maritime fulcrum came about. Yes. So Definitely. it's continuation and mm. also complementary to the identity as a democracy, yes. an identity as the uh, mm. uh, 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 Muslim majority. The other identity is obviously this network that we've built um, under ASEAN and also the track point five uh, related track point five such, such as CISCAP. Mm-hmm. I, would, I would like you to focus on that as well before we, we talk about ASEAN. You've involved in CISCAP, the uh, Council for Security Cooperation in the Asia Pacific. Uh, and in 2013, for example, you co-wrote that regional security outlook with Des Ball, Yusuf Wan, and Tony Milner. Uh, what was your experience about this track 1.5? What was the importance of this track 1.5? It's a very good testing ground, you know, for new ideas. Mm. That's that for sure, you know, because yes. the different scholars from different countries you came to a CIS- any CISCAP meeting, come up with the new ideas, and you tested it, you debated it, you know, and mm. then uh, you put it out there, you know, for yeah. all the policymakers to 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 to, to learn and also yeah. to uh, to adopt if they want to. Yes, that's I think is a very important function of mm. this uh, kind of uh, undertaking, mm. you know, the, mm. the CISCAP. But secondly, it's also important because you know you could use this forum. Yeah. To understand each other's position, yes, you know, and then explain it, you know, to yeah. other uh, participants from different countries, because yes. many of them are closely related to uh, each, you know, foreign ministries and government yes. and each uh, country of of, right. of this cap uh, mm. members. So that you know, I think uh, what I really uh, 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 value, you know, mm. in my involvement with with this uh, uh, CISCAP and also at the ASEAN level, the ASEAN uh, ISIS network, and. For young scholars at the time, yes. you know, I think it's very useful uh-huh. to be able to meet with, you know, uh, the sport yes. and with the Ralph Kosa, you know, yes. from the Pacific Forum. Yeah. And then, of course, in addition to all those uh, thinkers in the region, like my late Nordin Sopi in Malaysia, yes. yeah. Tan Sri Johar mm. you know, from Malaysia, uh, and also uh, a number of great scholars, you know, in, in Singapore and also mm. in, in Thailand. So, you know, you learn a lot. Yes, you know from you know from them that I learned a lot mm. you know, from them, and about the importance of regionalism, mm. about the importance of the epistem- epistemic community, mm. you know, which can contribute to the policy making process as well. Definitely, mm. and we are at Hadley Bull, where uh, Australian Seascape based at, yes. and uh, <laughs> this ball used to be the head of uh, SDSC, yeah. and. Uh, so we are very we are in the the, the environment where where CISCAP's very much uh, beloved and 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 regionalism especially uh, is is a proponent uh, there of of that uh, and in two thousand and nine though you you wrote this fairly provocative <laughs> piece that I think sent shock uh, and uh, trepidations and also admirations uh, across the region titled Indonesia need a post ASEAN foreign policy in the Jakarta post right uh, and obviously you write that with a very clear uh, and and compelling reason because Indonesia have shown its leadership and it's tried to lead and propose a lot of idea like human rights body and and view on ASEAN charter but largely ignored at the time but being in CISCAP and being so connected, what was it like? Uh, what was your thinking behind that? And what was the reactions around it? First, by that time, yes. uh, I came to the conclusion that most of our foreign policy objective mm. from 1967 has have been achieved through ASEAN. Mm. So, you know, the utility of ASEAN for Indonesia begin to change yes so let use this you know, example so you have like 10 national interests mm. right and then probably seven already achieved fulfilled yes. by 2009 yeah so and then you know you need ASEAN only for three yes uh, objective or three national interests then of course 
you start thinking like you know and then the, the interest change mm. right uh, it became 12 but seven already achieved through asean but the new one cannot be achieved through asean yes then you know it would be foolish in my view you know for indonesia to keep saying that we can achieve our national interest only through asean mm. you know because you know we could achieve many of our interest by working with other uh, platform as well for example g20 yes. you know so that's you know become uh, the uh, uh, another platform that mm. indonesia can achieve its national interest that's number one number two i'm a bit struck at the time by the fact that you know we over emphasize the importance of multilateral you know cooperation mm. to the disadvantage of bilateralism mm. because i do think that you know you need to balance that mm. you know, so it's not everything must be done through multilateral forum such as the asean yeah. so you need also to emphasize the importance of bilateral relationship because mm. at the end you know all this relationship comes down to the bilateral task right. so there is a need to balance that but mm. again being a writer <laughs> i think to come up with the title is very important yeah you provoke you know the readers yeah. you know, to pay attention to it but people tend to misinterpret it that you know yeah. this they thought that i was advocating indonesia to abandon exit yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 asean which is not but yeah. basically just to change you know that asean is the cornerstone into a cornerstone as the region change that concept of because this cap is part of the asia pacific uh initiative right and now there's new uh, concept of indo-pacific that carries different strategic imaginaries and uh different proposal do you think that with with this new concept it undermines the prior asia pacific um ideas and initiative like syscap or does it c- complement it and offer opportunities uh and and obviously thinking about the relevance of asean in the t- in this uh, context uh, what's your view on that well even before this term in the pacific you know become the uh, dominant theme mm. you know and the dominant concept in understanding the region mm. you no know, i think the activism and the role of syscap also begin to Uh, 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 fade away. Yes. You no. Know, so it's not as active as before. Mm. So you know, in that context, I don't think that you know the changing uh, uh, name, you know, or label, you yeah. know, is actually will affect that. So uh, of course, you know, what we need now is, I think, to reinvigorate, rejuvenate, you know, the uh, uh, syscap, mm. you know, uh, to 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 be able to deal with the current, you know, challenges, the current reality. Probably, you know, because again, you know, CISCAP is based on the uh, activism of each think tank, yeah. which is a member yeah. you know, of, of the CISCAP. Mm. You know, when this think tank, you know, are having a problem domestically in each national setting, mm. the CISCAP will have a problem too. Yes. So now I, I think uh, as we focus more on the Indo-Pacific, and I think it's the only platforms available for that is the East Asia Summit. Now yeah. it's, it's you know, important to start thinking about what sort of track to process mm. that can actually help the institutionalization of the East Asia, Asia Summit. Summit. Because SISCAP was formed in order to help the ASEAN Regional Forum. Yes, which Wayne... You know, I don't have any confidence in ASEAN yeah. Regional Forum anymore. Right. You know, so it's better to focus on the East Asia Summit. Mm. Then SISCAP should be, you know, remodeled or readjusted, you know, in order to live up to that new realities and needs right. of, of of the region right you right. don't need to change it into like you know indo pacific council of you know <laughs> security cooperation but the function of it should be geared toward helping and supporting the east asia summit to become the premier regional you know platform for uh, uh, member state you know to actually exchange ideas you know to have more dialogue you know, and, and 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 work on practical Yes. Uh, 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 as well. Right, right, right. And equally provocative to the idea of Indonesia needs to post ASEAN foreign policy. You've been proposing this past few days on revising ASEAN charter. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, how is that idea possible and why is that important, you think? What was the key trust and goal of from from 
that you are trying to address. right if if you remember the process at the time uh, there was something called ali alatas paper yes right uh, late ali alatas came up with the paper mm. on how the asian charter you know should be drafted and it, it contained a lot of you know great provisions mm. including the proposals on regime sanction yes you know it, it does contain mm. you know uh, that asean needs to have the sanction and so on you know mm. in order to enforce compliance but you know that proposal of course you know get watered down you know mm. by the, the the official uh, process you yeah. know of, of asean so the charter that we uh, uh, have now was passed in 2008 mm. as a result of compromise yes you know, between you know uh, many progressive elements you know in ASEAN and those you know who really want to maintain status quo. Mm. Indonesia was at the time under pa, uh, Hasan Wirayuda yes. you know he was at the forefront. So he was willing to compromise you know with the I mean the compromise was included in the charter. Mm. It says that charter can be reviewed after five years. Yes. But the problem was that nobody want to review it. You know <laughs> yeah. so even if they want to review it they give it to Tasa Sekretariat. Mm. So then you know as we begin to implement the charter and there were a lot of problems mm. because many of the provision within the charter are not really operationalized mm. and then the biggest problem is actually when we have to deal with Myanmar issue mm. then you know there are a lot of constraints within the charter yes. that you know make it difficult you know mm. for uh, ASEAN to really you know address that particular mm. problem that's why you know i again you know think that you know it's time probably you know to look at the charter again mm. and then you know uh, look at where you know it become a constraint mm. where it can facilitate the work of asean and then revise it Definitely. come up with the idea and we do have some ideas mm. the, the areas that we need to change number yes. one the charter doesn't have crisis you know prevention or mm. crisis management mechanism mm. so we should have a new mm. chapter that deals with that yes on the decision making process yeah. you know so consensus is hard to you know come by <laughs> you know, especially you know, if we have different interests the funding issue mm. the role of secjet and the role of you know uh, ambassadors uh, i mean the uh, permanent representative you know and so on so but i know that you know many asean countries are reluctant yes. to embrace this idea mm. uh, another alternative proposal is actually out there yeah. if we cannot revise the articles provision in the charter probably we need to think about the protocol mm. you know of you know certain aspect or certain provision within the charter they're probably more acceptable more palatable you know mm. to uh, asean countries now i want to focus more on your journey uh, into track one <laughs> because we've been we've going from track two track 1.5 now uh, your involvement in in track one And uh, you've mentioned already that concept of global maritime fulcrum, right? Which basically come in a very, in a way, unique juncture of r- fundamental reassessment of changing region. Uh, great power competitions started intensifying China's rise. And I think it's started influencing the way we think as well and really highlighting that maritime identity part right how involved were you in that in the in that formulation of concept well actually it's a work of a team you know mm. it's a, 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 a policy team you know of the campaign team of Pak Jokowi at that time yeah 2014 uh, there were a number of members of that of that team you know we all thought that you know we need to really think uh, 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 about our position you know in the region and then what sort of you know policy that you know we need to recommend to Pak Jokowi yes. you know if he became a uh, 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 president mm. so we saw the you know it's a very simple process you know yes. we saw the map yeah and then you know we realized that you know Indonesia is right there at yeah. the center between two oceans mm. and then at that time you know the Japanese you know and then the the, the, the Australians begin to talk about the Indo-Pacific you know mm. and then the Japanese begin to talk about the confluence of the the two ocean and so on and then we realized that Indonesia and ASEAN is really the fulcrum of it yeah you know at, at, at that that's you know should be you know i think uh, the basis of new foreign policy at least for mm-hmm. the next you know five to ten years uh, uh because we realized this 
the shift in the center of gravity yeah you know from you know the uh, 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 west to the east so that's why you know uh, uh, we came up with the ideas that uh, Indonesia should also you know re-emphasize its identity as you know the uh, maritime power yeah you know so, and then you know become the maritime fulcrum the idea was based on the understanding that as the maritime fulcrum is basically Indonesia is responsible you know for maintaining security and stability in the two ocean mm. you know it's going back to the ideas of the Sri Vijaya you know, and so yeah, on yeah. you know, that's role that we used to play back then yeah uh, and now you know because all this competition cooperation and also uh, economic uh, uh, trajectory mm. will depend very much you know on, on on the sea then it is time for Indonesia to pay attention to this yeah and when you try to sell it to Pak Jokowi how uh, was it an easy sell or was it a difficult sell there is an easy sell in fact you know even though the team started you know uh, uh, with the well, within the campaign in yeah. the context but later on you know we realized that Pak Jokowi is really serious about it when yeah. he talk about uh, a tall loud you yeah. know the, yeah, the, yeah, the, the yeah. sea tall you know and, and so on and then it's basically so he want to focus more on the maritime infrastructure yes you know as the basis for Indonesia is becoming a, a, a trading nation yeah. and so on so he's very serious on, on that mm. one the challenge now is basically how you integrate you know all the other pillars yes you know, uh, and, you know into a coherent uh, a policy that can you know basically uh, 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 go beyond uh, Pak Jokowi's you know, presidency yes. you know, after 2024 yeah there's yeah. always been a challenge and one of the interesting moment obviously Pak Jokowi has favorite of all these pillars, especially the tollout and the connectivity. Mm-hmm. And it became one of the way Indonesia and China relates to each other, especially with the investment DRI. and DRI. And there's a lot of attempt trying to connect these two concepts. What was the behind the scene process? Was there a lot of trepidations on connecting these two or was it really Gayung bersambut, as we say it in no, Indonesia. Basically, you know, we don't see any, you know, uh, tension, any contradiction yes. with Indonesia's, you know, emphasis, you know, on the need to build uh, the uh, maritime infrastructure yeah. with the Chinese, you know, uh, 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 program of the Belt and Road Initiative. Yeah. You know, so it's kind of like you know, complementary. Yes. Uh, but the maritime fulcrum ideas is more than that. Yeah. Because you know, Pajoki also pay attention to the fourth and the fifth pillars. Yes which is the Dip- maritime defense and, diplomacy, and maritime yeah, diplomacy. Yeah, diplomacy. So you can, you know, where you can tell from the fact that in, I think, 2015, mm-hmm. when Pajokowi responded, you know, to this uh, 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 tension, quote-unquote, in the South China Sea, Six, you know, by well, having, he, yeah, by yeah, having the cabinet meeting. meeting and oh, so yeah. on. And then, you know, he basically, you know, made it very, very clear that, you know, you can't actually focus on one or two pillars. You have to yeah. be, you know, coherent, even though the priority of course, you know, still on the maritime infrastructure, building yeah. port, making sure that, you know, the uh, the, 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 the tall sea, uh, sea mm. tall, you know, continue to be an important agenda you know, yeah. to, during these two, two periods of his government. And being an expert or some, a scholar who studied Indonesia-China relations, what was your advice f- for Pak Jokowi at a time when he had to reconcile that to conflicting interests, right? protecting Indonesia's sovereignty versus deepening cooperations. How how did uh, you advise him at the time? No, you know, I think Pak pa Jokowi also, you know, already, uh, I think, uh, in deep understanding that, mm. you know, communication, dialogue, engagement is very important, you know, yeah. to convey what you think, to convey what you need, yeah. and to convey what your interests are. Yes. You know, that's why, you know, I think uh, he put a lot of emphasis, you know, in these three aspects of relationship with no, with, with, with China. Mm. At that time, I think, you know, the way Pak Jokowi, you know, see our relationship with China is very, you know, uh, 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 clear. Yeah. We, he look at, you know, the numbers, you know, in terms of investment yes. and trade between Indonesia and the US, Indonesia, EU, Indonesia, Japan, Indonesia, South Korea, mm. and then Indonesia, China. So basically all these other countries is already up here. Mm. It's very high interaction, you know, trade-wise and investment-wise. Mm. But China is still, you know, quite low. Hmm. So his intention was actually how to bring up China's investment and trade with China to go up, you yeah. know, so on par with other 
countries mm. such as Malaysia, Singapore, Japan, Korea, and so on. Yes. So that's what he's doing. Yeah. So that's why you know I think in one of my uh, work, I try to explain that this is not like tilting toward China. And it's not yeah. leaning toward China, but it's an attempt to bring China, you know, uh, to get more investment and trade with Indonesia on par with other yeah. uh, powers. And in a way, it's one of the, I wouldn't say classic. Perhaps it is a classic strategy of Indonesia to generate benefits, right? We, in in in, I remember when I was in uh, my undergrad, Pak Bantarto Bandoro mm-hmm. teach me, us I guess uh, about those you know tilting to Russia to get U.S. attention, for example, right? So there, it, it's kind of like ingrained in our mind about. Uh, the strategy to generate to tap into great power uh, competitions to some extent. No, I think we we passed that. We, you pass, yeah, we, we passed think, that. So we, because now we, you know, we start by looking at what are our real interests, mm. right? And then you know we look at those interests. Okay, on this one, I think it would be bene- more beneficial if we work with US. Yes. On this interest, probably it would be more helpful to work with China. So that's I think how the government now is working. Yeah. You know, so it's not like you know asking what Russia can do or what China can do or what you know the uh, uh, US can do, yeah. but more like what we want to achieve. Yeah. So that's I think is the correct way you know of shaping and formulating you know our trade policies, our foreign policies. The core is should be Indonesia's national interest. And being a Sumatran that you are that we are we can't help but continue our independent and criticisms right even though you are part of the COVID team you're still quite critical of some of his uh, policy for example the need for a more assertive uh, position in South China Sea or uh, the need to to have a more outreach a bigger outreach in Muslim majority countries in the Middle East and uh, to be cautious not aligned with any power right and and uh but how do you tread that water of you know being in the inside but also still quite critical of or is that a value is that an asset even well i think it's, it's, it's important yeah. you know because you know uh being in in you know, inside doesn't mean that you know you basically become blind yeah. you know to, to, to everything that's going on around you mm. but you need to be able you know to also you know critically see where things need to be improved mm. so that's basically uh, 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 my line mm. you know when i try to you know encourage the the policy makers you know to do more on certain sectors yes. so th- that's also probably a reflection of the fact that i'm also a think tanker if you yes. like you know this yeah. part of this uh, an independent you know uh, uh, thinkers usually you know if you are inside and then you know you tend to you know uh, 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 not to see things you know in in a very clear way yeah so even i'm inside at the time then usually you know i take you know a distance yeah and then try to look at the issue mm. from outside which yeah. usually give us you know a clearer picture mm. and then can pinpoint where the improvements i needed mm. so that's basically you know why uh, it seems that there's certain issues that i'm quite focal yeah. you know in that and and pushing Uh, the uh, government, you know, to go into that direction or to become uh, or take, you know, certain, you know, policy line, yes, which yeah. they did not uh, 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 do and so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And did Pak Jokowi take criticism well? Oh, he's very open to criticism, mm. you know. So, but on the foreign policy, you know, so I think uh, uh, my ideas or my comments or my views, uh, I. Communicated more with the foreign ministry, yes. You no, know, because at the end, our friends at the foreign ministry right. you know, will formulate it, you know, make it into you know, into policy, especially with the uh, Ibu Ratno. Yes, and then she's also very open to all suggestion, yes. all uh, uh, ideas, you know, from from outside. Yes, because things have changed in Indonesia, mm-hmm. you know. Yes. So it's not well. Of course, there are those uh, uh, diplomats who think that you know they know the best. Yeah, that foreign <laughs> policy should be left to them. Yeah. But you know, we should keep telling them that. Foreign policy is too important to be left to the foreign ministry alone. The, your journey to the ambassadorship positions, right? That 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 was interesting. And what was the journey like? Well, when was it? Uh, what happened when you, Pak Jokowi asked you to be 
Well, mm. when the president asks, you know, give you, uh, you know, uh, assign you something, <laughs> of course, you know, you just say, you know, uh, uh, you will do your best. Yes. That's basically what what happened. Uh, I think <clears throat> one thing is very interesting. Yes. You know, when you were outside, you know, mm -hmm. at the government, you thought that you know, the government should have been able to do this. Yes. But when you get inside, you get a more complete information. Yeah. Then you realize that it's not that easy. Yeah. So because there are things that you need to also adjust and mm. then calculate before mm. you know you take action, because there are constraints. Those constraints sometimes only available to those who work from inside. Yes. You know, well, outside a commentator is the yeah. easiest work actually. You just comment. This is not right. I want you to do this, to do that. But you know, when you inside, you have to do it. Then you have to consider a lot of factors, and then the information available to you is much more diverse mm. compared to that you are you know, uh, outside of uh, the government. That serves both as a constraint and also as a facilitating factor, you know, in formulating and shaping your thinking on certain, you know. So that's what I learned yeah. you know, from my four and a half years, you know, in 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 in, in London. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Of, you know, work with the foreign ministry. And as an ambassador at that time, what what kept you at night? Uh, mostly, you know, of course, you know, we all given mm. the targets by the president, you know, so how to create uh, the uh, conducive environment for, you know, uh, 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 British investors or yeah. Chinese investors, those uh, who, are, I mean, for the, the, the China, Indonesia ambassador yeah. to China and so on. Because Fa Jokowi want to emphasize on the yes. economic diplomacy. Yes. So that's, you know, I think uh, something that I learned that, you know, we need a lot of improvement in terms of the uh, ability of our diplomats to understand what are the things that we need to do in order to do the you know uh, uh, economic diplomacy mm. and 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 also uh, 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 what sort of infrastructure that we need you know diplomatic infrastructure yes. that we need in order to uh, fulfill that task from from the president uh, in the UK uh, there are two other you know problem that I think uh, is quite critical that mm. you know I think uh, took up a lot of my time number one it's actually to make the people, you know, in in, yes. in the UK aware about Indonesia. Yeah. Because the level of awareness about Indonesia is very low. Yeah. Uh, second one is actually how to, you know, really uh, 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 talk to and explain to members of parliament and the media mm. about, you know, the situation in Indonesia. Yes. So that's also because of lack of interest. Mm. Then, you know, it's of course, you know, because lack of, uh, understanding and, and, and awareness about what's going on in Indonesia. For example, you know, I was surprised, like, you know, very few people knew that Indonesia is a democracy, for example, <laughs> right? So you need to, backing is also true here in Australia. Mm. You know, 40% yes. only of the Australia's population uh, 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 knows that Indonesia is democracy. 60% think that we're still under military dictatorship. Mm. So this is the public diplomacy work yes. that keep me awake at night no, it, 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 it. <laughs> and um, having served as an ambassador and, and really experienced that Bebas Active uh, firsthand what is Bebas Active in your view now after having experienced yeah, it Bebas Active is not non-involvement is not indifference mm. you know so you have to have an opinion on certain things mm. on almost everything mm. yeah, really but you know you got to have certain principles that you keep yeah uh, for example, you know, Russia's, take Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Yes. If you want to really do the Bebas Active, then you have to also subscribe to the principle mm. international law. You do not invade other countries, mm. period. And then, you know, you can speak against it. You know, so that's, you know, a manifestation of the true Bebas yes. Active. So as long as you subscribe to those universal principles, then you can actually uh, 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 conduct the free yes. and active, you know, in the truest manner. Yes. Otherwise, very difficult. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Scholars often being dubbed as out of touch, you know, being an mm. ivory tower. But uh, practitioners are often dubbed as narrow-minded, unable to see the bigger picture because they're so involved in, in it, right? And having been both, um, how should we learn from each other? They need to talk to each other more, mm. right? You know, and then uh, so that's why we're in CSIS, for example, yes. the way we, we deal with this particular problem, 
uh, we also ask help from the uh, uh, senior diplomats, you know, who already retired, you mm. know, to be a fellow at CSIS, mm. so they can actually help the younger, you know, a policy analyst yes. to understand whether the ideas are visible or not, mm. because the key. A uh, 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 a task for the policy analyst is to make sure that whatever ideas they come up with, first has to be based on rigorous academic analysis, yeah. but at the same time also based on practicality and relevance. Yeah, it's no point of having these ideas, you know, yeah. utopian ideas, but you can't implement it. Yeah, uh, that's well possible because you don't have any knowledge about the reality. Mm. So bringing together the you know practitioners and policy analysts help. So for example, at CSIS, you know, we used to have Pak Ambassador Makari Bibisono, yeah. Pak Lid Wiriono. You know, yes. he helped all of us, you know, the younger analysts to understand the policy world and you know combine it with the academic world. So that's very important. But since Pak Hasan became the foreign minister, yeah. there is this dialogue and exchanges. Quite mm. you know, I think. Uh, rigorously yes. you know, between the policy analysts, the academia, and you know mm. those you know who work within the foreign ministry until today. Uh, for example, when Pak Siswo, the current ambassador yes. to Australia, was the head of the research and development yes. agency, you no, know, he also very active, you know, in engaging the uh, 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 researchers community, mm. think tank community, you know, discussing a lot of of, of issues. Mm. So that you know I think is the the, the only way that you know, you can. Uh, 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 help, you know, address this, you know, I think a uh, uh, problem that you just uh, mentioned. How to, you know, bridge the gap in between the policy world and the, you know, academic academic world. Secondly, uh, it's very important for the academics to also read current affairs, mm. current events. Yeah. So what I find is quite irritating is that yeah. you know if those you know academic think that they don't need to read. Newspapers. Yeah. They only read, you know, textbook. Yeah. Then you know the relevance is not there. Yes. You know, so they don't understand, you know, what's going on in the yeah. world, you know, because they don't read newspapers. So that is the biggest mistake that academic, you know, can make. Yes. You know, by thinking that, you know, as an academic, they only read books and journals, and the practitioners read newspapers. Yes. But current events, current affairs is also very important, you know, for the academics to read. Yes, yes, and my last question is to, uh, as someone who've seen how policy is being and have made policy yourself, as an academic who study decision making, what will be some of the things that we need to really pay attention to uh, in studying decision making and policy? Two things. Number one is you, we have to be able to think in terms of policy options. Yes. Right. Uh, option A consequences. Con- option B consequences. That way of thinking is critical mm. for both academics and also for policymakers, yes. practitioners, uh, because you know you cannot just come up with the ideas. This is what you have to do. Yeah. Then you know it doesn't fly with yes. the you know policymakers. Yeah. But the academic should be able to come up with say, option A, option B, option C, C, yeah. and then give them. The plus and minuses of each mm. option, so that is a very, I think, you know, uh, important is a very uh, critical, you know, that the, the academic uh, uh, should learn. The secondly, academic should not get upset if their ideas are not adopted, mm. you know, by the policymakers, <laughs> because the job of the academic is not to push for policy. Uh, certain policy, mm. you know, as they are for it, mm. uh, but you know, to put ideas out there. Mm. But if you can do the first thing, yeah. which is option policy options way of thinking, then the second one is more likely. So the policymakers will be, you know, uh, will feel that they get help. Mm. So because they can think the option A plus minus is like this. Mm. Option B that help them, you know, to make decision. Mm. But do never give only one policy alternative, mm. and then try to push them, you know, to agree with your thinking. Mm. So it doesn't work at all. Mm. So two lessons that I think you know we all need to learn. <laughs> really great lessons, Pa. And uh, thank you so much for My sharing pleasure. your uh, amazing insight. And uh, I hope to see you again and have coffee in Jakarta next time. Yeah, just thank you so much for that great lesson. Thank you. This is Southeast Thank you for Asia having is. me.